set the scene uh, but let me pose a question let me explore this question why are we having this session well over the last several weeks our world seems to have been turned upside down first came the COVID-19 pandemic and whilst it's been devastating for everyone I'm sure no one can have failed to hear about the disproportionate impact on black Asian and minority ethnic communities or the underlying inequalities which contribute to this picture in the midst of that scene came the brut brutal killing of George Floyd in the United States, with the mass outcry around the world and the surge of the Black Lives Matter movement. For some of us, these occurrences are news, something we hear about, but which don't necessarily touch us personally. For others, it's our lived experience. And it is very easy for the church to look, to offer statements, as the URC rightly did, to lament the situation and situations out there. But the church is people, and many of the church's people number amongst those for whom the statistics, the inequalities, and the injustices are experiences of life. So there comes the question, what about us as the church? As we look at the world, is our own house in order? The truth is, the URC doesn't exist in a void. We came into being in a context of white privilege. We exist in a context of white privilege. We are shaped by a context of white privilege. Those are statements of fact rather than questions for debate. But the question is then, how do we respond to these realities? Are we oblivious to the reality and impact of white privilege? Are we in denial because we're all nice church people getting along together, so where's the problem? Or are we actively challenging the status quo, recognizing and resisting the power and influence of the racist systems in which we exist? That is what the church calls the world to do. But are we, the church, living a good example for the world? Do Black Lives Matter right here? Do Black Lives Matter in the URC? So let's get you thinking straight away. A statement is going to appear on your screen in a moment. I think in practice that black lives do matter in the URC. To what extent do you agree? Let's put it to the vote and see what you think. So we can see that there was actually quite, quite a, mixed, a mixed bag of results. Perhaps unsurprisingly, our views are varied. I think it depends on who we are, where we are, what our experiences and reflections have been. And so today we have two speakers sharing their thoughts, their insights, their reflections to help us unpack and explore our theme. Speaking first is Wale Hudson-Roberts. Welcome, Wale. Justice enabler for the Baptist Union of Great Britain. Wale is a pastor, racial justice coordinator for the Baptist Union, and he serves the Baptist World Alliance as their lead on racial justice issues. Wale is obviously not a member of the URC, but he brings a breadth of insight and experience which necessarily speak into the URC context. Today, Wale is rooting our conversation in a biblical and theological reflection, and what more appropriate place for us to begin as people who seek to walk the Jesus way. So I'm delighted, delighted to welcome Wale. And just to give Wale a, a helping hand as if he needed it, I'm going to share the text that he's going to be ex exploring and unpacking for us and it's Jesus cleanses the temple. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Wale, over to you. Thank you, Karen. The temple descended upon by Jesus remained the religious center of Israel's political life and power. It was at the temple that the priests obediently represented Roman interest to their own people, at times even collecting taxes to place in Roman hands. 
Decisions were made at the temple that impacted the lives of many, many people. The temple was at the heart of Israel's economy, its central bank and treasury, the depository of immense wealth. This is why what seems to some just as a burst of outrage against merchants was so much more. It was a very public act and even attack aimed at Israel's center of power. In other words, this was a political act or even attack. Jesus and his followers seized the temple grounds and temporarily halted commercial operations. Why? Because despite its veneer of holiness, beneath its proclamations of justice, the temple did not treat people as bearers of the image of God. Den of robbers was a fitting three words. This scathing expression Jesus uses in his condemnation of the temple merchants comes directly from one of the most bitter attacks against the temple in all the Bible, God's declaration of judgment upon the temple in Jeremiah. The priests, who were meant to uphold justice in the temple, were found wanting as they exploited the image of God in the people they were called to serve in the temple. Jesus' anger in the face of institutional injustice, therefore, was rightly and justifiably palpable. To the question, do black lives matter in the URC? If they do matter, you should be able to answer yes to the following questions. Each of the questions I'm about to pose find their origins in the temple story recorded for us by Mark in chapter 11. Firstly, is the URC on an intentional journey to decolonize its structures? This is what Jesus began in the temple. His was not a temper tantrum or a sudden fit of rage. Jesus had already shown he had trouble in mind when he cursed the fig tree just before entering the temple in Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 14. This, therefore, was no spontaneous eruption. Jesus' protest, critique, and repudiation of the unjust temple structures was well planned and was carried out without a hitch as he sought to, to deconstruct aspects of the temple culture. If Black Lives Matter, therefore, to the URC, you will have begun to work towards decolonizing your church structures. This involves more than just a critique of them, but the creation of a detailed strategy with associated recommendations that outline how the URC church can begin decolonizing the structures which may, in their present reality, unwittingly disempower people of color. Have you begun this decolonization process? Number two. Are the URC on an intentional journey to decolonize its theology? You will have noticed that I reread this Markham passage through a liberation prism or lens. Black liberation theology affirms that God is on the side of the oppressed blacks. It announces that God does more than empathy with the oppressed, but seeks our liberation. This story in Mark highlights this approach. Jesus sides with the oppressed and critiques and seeks to violently dismantle the systems of the rich. In so doing, he is decolonizing the theology of the powerful rich priests. Decolonizing theology is a multi-voiced approach to listening to God, reflecting on a multi-voiced interpretation in understanding God, leading to a church that shouts for theological diversity, exalted, celebrated, and respected in every aspect of its life. Have you began this journey towards decolonizing theology? Number three. Are the URC on an intentional journey to decolonize relationships? I maintain that at the very heart of this passage is the decolonization of relationships. 
the man from Galilee, Jesus, the man who lived under the shadow of the Roman Empire, challenges the powerful priests to act justly and do mercy in their relationships, not with just some people, but indeed all people. To let go of power and privilege, Jesus was communicating via his actions, and treat all people as holy. In this temple engagement, Jesus seeks to equalize relationships, hoping that subsequent temple relationships will be altogether and absolutely characterized by justice, peace, and embrace. Have you began this journey towards decolonizing your theology? So let us return to the question. Do Black Lives Matter to the URC? If you say no to most of these questions, you are in the same place of possibly every denomination that I know, which might suggest Black Lives really don't matter. For us to matter requires more than sheer articulation of words, sorry, mere articulation of words and platitudes, but a systematic critique and deconstruction of white privilege, which involves the giving away of some power and influence to those who have little, indeed none, and reconstructing a church that is reflective of our theology as well as yours our traditional practices as well as yours, our ecclesiology as well as yours, our church culture as well as yours. This is the practice of decolonization. Back to the question, do black lives matter in the URC? Thank you, Wale. Thank you for that challenging presentation. I think you've given us plenty of food for deep, deep thought. And so in the meanwhile, we're going to hear from our next speaker. So let me, in, let me, let me um, introduce to you Patricia Akoli, and I'm delighted to welcome Patricia. Patricia is a young adult who has spent her whole life in the URC, from childhood through adolescence into adulthood. She's a gifted youth and community worker, using her interests and talents in the arts to plan and deliver sessions in local URC contexts. Patricia has recently co-delivered diversity awareness training for URC Church House and the staff there, and she has been called upon to contribute to various aspects of URC life. While Patricia doesn't claim to be an expert on the URC per se, she does bring us the wisdom of her reflections as a black person who has negotiated and is still negotiating life in the United Reformed Church. Patricia, over to you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for that wonderful intro. <laughs> and thank you, Wale, for so much food for thought. Um, as previously mentioned, I'll add to this conversation my reflection. So, do Black Lives Matter in the URC? It should. The answer should be yes. But, it, but the fact that the Black Lives Matter organization even exists in 2020, and that it takes the murder of yet another black man before an outcry of this magnitude happens, probably clues us into the fact that the answer isn't wholly yes. The catalyst of George Floyd's death should evoke disgust. It should evoke anger. It should compel to action. But will it? Will there be deep introspection and interrogation into matters of slavery and the repercussions that linger in our societies to today? And when we've done that, when will it be enough? When do we as a society tick that box and say, yeah, that's done, we sorted it. Sorted it enough for people to feel like they're living in a society with equal rights and opportunities. This movement that spurred people up and down the UK and across the world, what issues have moved people strongly enough to come out of their houses and protest en masse during a global pandemic? Injustices that have seeped into every aspect of people's everyday lives. How are black people disproportionately affected in housing, foster care, finance, education, academia, general and mental health, politics, law, the criminal justice system? And that's just to name a few. How can we reconcile these issues? 
as people living in the world and as Christians because they did not happen out of a vacuum. And even the church's past involvement in slavery and colonization is also a facet to this conversation. And if you've never wrestled with these issues, why? And if not now, when? And if this is not a wrestle of, your, of faith, what is it? Because when you wrestle with your faith, you wrestle, you're wrestling in your context. So I'll briefly, briefly give you a little bit of my own context, which you've heard a little of. As you've heard, I grew up in a URC church, High Cross in Tottenham, where the co congregation is roughly well, a large percentage of it is West Indian, predominantly Jamaican, and West African, predominantly Ghanaian, but there are many, many more as well within that. I was lucky enough to grow up within a church with a very robust youth project, which took a lot of love and dedication and hard work from a lot of people. And one of them is in this panel right now. Thank you, Karen. And Lorraine in the audience, and Sandra in the audience, and probably some more that I haven't even seen. It was within this atmosphere where the question of identity and how you move into the, in the world as young people, as people of color and Christians were investigated. And in those processes of exposing ourselves to new places and con contexts, we learned how to navigate within those situations which were so removed from our everyday. How to, we discovered the tensions or challenges in those moments and then we resolve and find out how they were resolved and what joys could be found in that discovery. Looking back those different parts, looking back now, each part of my church life has had a different focus. Some, till this day, I think I was tricked into, honestly. <laughs> some I stumbled into, or some I didn't know I was being led into, and some I fully stepped into, self-aware. There's the community cafe, community created and run for young people as a response to our community and what we needed to see around us. There was the Ghanaian conference committee prompted by the imbalance of representation within leadership roles, where congregation with large Ghanaian makeups, but very low numbers in lay preaching ministry and higher positions in the wider church. People felt there was a blockage or hurt, hurdle to what new systems could have been put into place for people to feel empowered. And that was also where I met one woman, Catalina, who still to this day, I'm filled with awe. I was a racial justice advocate for Thames North. Um, and as you've heard, I worked with youth work within the church. I was a URC youth rep for the Council for World Mission and co-led co diversity training at Church House but I still feel like I'm at the very beginning of my journey. The commonality with these different aspects of my church life was that there were places where I wanted to find myself home and equal. And for people who looked and talked like me to feel that there was space and I wanted to help make that space in the wider URC church. The death of George Floyd, George Floyd. I can't remember if I found it myself, if it came up on a feed or a tag, if I saw it on a comment stream and I find my own way there. But I, if you watched it or a part of it, I'm sure there was that moment where you realize you're watching the video of a man's death. And it had to be racism. It had to be beyond prejudice, beyond bias, beyond bigot bigotry or any softening of the term. The system of racism and what underpinned slavery, you know, besides greed, was the removal of personhood. And this man who carried out his actions in such a calm and unaffected manner didn't. He couldn't have believed that he was kneeling on the neck of a fellow human being. And part of why I said yesterday was because at that time, I couldn't speak, I couldn't think. I came off of social media, I was done. I was filled to the brim. I, I remember having conversations with my cousins similarly before this about how I'm tired or I just can't intake any more of this su suffering and pain. I'm becoming desensitized. It's not my everyday experience, but in some way 
it was a call to witness and see. And especially when you're not experiencing the level of turmoil that people are, are on their day to day. You have to discover what prompts you or what fires you enough to look at your own context and examine what you know is not right. My feelings when it went from a burn to a boil to a simmer over and over again. There were so many, I watched so many <laughs> news, news articles and, and news specials and people being questioned, oh, we've had this big protest now, things will get better. How? Life doesn't happen like that. The complexities of undoing systems of oppression are vast. So when the coining of anti-racism came, came around and the distinguishing of I'm not racist to I'm an anti-racist, I did perk up and I listened to what people were say, saying. It was saying that inaction needed to be confronted. Inaction in accepting a skewed reality is being complicit to a system that is purposefully designed to disadvantage people. In action to accepting a skewed reality is being complicit to a system that is purposefully designed to disadvantage people. In those moments, company after company came out with their statements, but the proof will come, I hope the proof will come when those promises are rooted in action and written into the mandate of every company and organization and institution. So that happen and there's action, seeing is not believing. For myself, I know that I have not finished learning, that I need to learn more. And there was points in my life where I stopped taking the new information. I stopped seeking new information. And as we know, it's such a powerful, it's power. Knowledge is power. For me, information is layered, but essentially boils down to two types of knowledge. There's the things we, ne we need to function in the world. For instance, you should know the correct way to pay your taxes, taxes hopefully. <laughs> and then there's things you should know that gives, us, that gives us the knowledge of how to flourish in the world and ways that will help us to self-actualize and take us to being the best versions of ourselves as human beings as brothers and sisters in Christ. How do you relate that to those different aspects in your own life? For myself and in the work I do, mine is within participation, within the art. How do you get people involved? What, what makes you happy with this process? How do you, are you taking in the experiences of those people who are coming to become, who are coming to you to be changed? What are your own biases and prejudices that are stopping people from feeling like they belong? Are you exploring them? If the answer is no, then you have serious work to do. I think we all have serious work to do. So I end again. Are you making sure that it's built into your practice? <laughs> Sorry, I sort of lost the train. But do Black Lives Matter in the URC? I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs>